And welcome to the Industry 4.0 Weekly Podcast hosted by 4.0 Solutions for Tuesday, November 15th, 2022. We are live. I am your host with the most, Walker D. Reynolds. Uh, the topic for today, the, as you guys should know, uh, you should already be aware, the thumbnail says, why do 80% of digital transformation initiatives fail? We are going to have this conversation centered around a LinkedIn post that um, we did, I think, a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, that that really took off. And I got a lot of um, messages, private messages and public messages centered around it. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about that um, here in just a little bit. Um, if you have any questions centered around digital transformation, a little hint here, 80% uh, of the reason or the reason 80% of digital transformations fails. Uh, part of the reason is because some of the projects that people are actually doing is not actually digitally trans digital transformation. And we'll have a conversation about that here in a second. Um, some announcements uh, as a quick reminder tomorrow, I will be presenting, uh, doing a keynote address for the uh, Mesa Africa year end event, the Manufacturing Enterprise Solutions Association. This is my second year um, speaking at the conference. Uh, Josh will put the link up. He'll put the link in the comments and also uh, on the screen. Um, the topic of my conversation will be Industry 4.0 Transformation, the big picture. Um, I'm going to be having um, a, a lot of the stuff that we generally talk about. I'm going to be dropping, dropping into that presentation. But uh, a little sneak peek is centered around, you know, what what industry 4.0 is and isn't, what digital transformation is and isn't. Um, you know, a lot of it's just misinformation stuff. Um, like a, a good example. The other day, someone sent me a, um, uh, tagged me on a post in LinkedIn. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, I wasn't going to talk about this, but we will. Someone tagged me on a post on LinkedIn. And it was from an integrator in Europe. Uh, let me see if I can't find this. Um, sorry, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I think it's really important about this. Um, it is. T -t 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 it is. Sorry. Crap. I wish I remembered that that about this. Uh, I can't find it. But anyway, there was this uh, this integrator in Europe who was talking about digital transformation. And clearly what they had done was they had, you know, taken a graphic that we had that I've used, that we've developed, that I've used, and they sort of hijacked it for their own purposes, okay? Which, by the way, would be fine if they hadn't changed the graphic, okay? One of the things I talk about when it comes to, you know, unified namespace and all the stuff that we do, you know, we have an open source mentality. The only thing that I care about about the work that we do here, if people are going to use our terms, our methodologies, that kind of stuff, is that they don't change the definition of them. They don't try to hijack the meaning of the term. OK, and this this integrator did. And what they did is that you guys will um, right here. It is found it. Uh, this uh, and Asaf is the one who tagged me on it. Uh, Asaf Kadash. But there was this guy, Jan Madsen, who is with I don't know what integrator he's with, but he he's with Enuda, E-N-U-D-A. OK, um, and. What he did was he posted this this uh, this graphic <coughs> that is it's a it's it's a graphic that we that we use that he copied and then he just modified it okay and it basically says digital transformation at the top and it says get all data uh, anything to everybody when and where they need it we use we actually say get the data and information in the hands of the people where they need it when they need it and in the format they need it okay. On the left-hand side of his graphics, he's got Industry 4.0, and he's got Digital Thread, 
you know, so he's got PLC to HMI to SCADA to MES to ERP to cloud. And he's got that in a digital thread going into the cloud. And then he's got a arrow that goes to the right called digital transformation. It says industry 4.0 on the right. And then what he's got is <clears throat> plug everything into the same platform. And it looks like a unified namespace. And he's got, you know, warehouse management, PLC, ERP, historical data, HMI, SCADA, MES. Okay. The, the post that he did was he hijacked a, a message that we, we send, okay? And he changed it. And he changed the message to say that digital transformation is going from, is, is going from industry 3.0, which is linear integration using digital thread technology, you know, point to point integrations up a stack to one common platform, platform in the middle that you build all your solutions in. That is not digital transformation, okay? That's a solution centric approach. The platform is the solution. We, what we teach is technology centric. There's a unified namespace based on common technology and there's many different platforms and solutions. Now you need an IIoT platform to do some abstraction and build solutions. But what he did was he hijacked the message maybe intentionally or intent unintentionally. It doesn't matter whether there was intention behind it or not. But part of why people are confused about what digital transformation is or isn't, what industry 4.0 is or isn't, is because people keep coming up with their own definitions of what the terms mean, okay? If you were to do <clears throat> what he's proposing here, this guy, Jan Madsen, J-A-N-M-A-D-S-E-N, -E and his, it looks like his post was from a week ago, um, he, what you would end up with is building all, every solution you have in your business inside of ignition. Okay. Like, and he's an ignition integrator and he says, and he, his whole post is about, you know, we build stuff in ignition and we teach people to do that. what he did was he took, he took what we communicate and clearly took a graphic that we built. Okay repurpose that graphic you know he just basically copied it and put his own graphics in it and hijacked it to say that the unified namespace thing on the right is ignition and put ignition with a platform there that is confusing so if a customer comes to us and says hey i that graphic you just put on the screen looks a lot like this guy jan madsen who put this at inuba whatever um well no i'd say that's horseshit that don't don't put a platform in the center. That's building a wall on top of a couch. Put technology in the center. Okay. A platform would be buying my buying the the two by fours for my house from one, you know, one special size two by four. That's not a two by four. It's some, you know, from one manufacturer who own has a patent on that specific type of stud. Okay. So that I'm stuck with only what they can provide. Okay, that that's what you're you're looking at. I I never you will never hear me say put ignition in the middle of your business. You'll never hear me say that. I love ignition. I love it as a platform. I absolutely love it. But I would never tell anyone to build the digital future of their business on a platform. One platform. That's fucking insane. That's insanity. Okay? So part of what I'll be talking about in the Mesa thing tomorrow is Digital transformation, industry 4.0, the big picture. Okay. By the way, because I called Jan out, I'd love to have him have him on the podcast so he could maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I misread it here. I'm not wrong. But the, you know, it, maybe it's not intentional. I find it hard to believe it's not intentional. Uh, Asaf, thank you for tagging me. By the way, if he had just taken a graphic of ours and reused it, I would have been good with it because he wouldn't have changed and redefined what our message was. But that's a different message than what we teach here. We don't teach put ignition in the center, okay? We do not teach that. That's insanity. Don't do that, okay? Uh, John McLeod, our chief experience officer is gonna be at Automation Fair in Chicago tomorrow and Thursday. Um, interesting thing, you know, about uh, Automation Fair this year, okay? Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was reading, I was prepping for automation fair. And I was, you know, Hey, I was thinking about maybe going when John said he was going to go. And I was, 
reading about what their keynote is going to be. And it's like perspectives, I think, is the is going to be the keynote. And it said, learn about the changing face of manufacturing, how leaders are leveraging technology to tackle sustainability, workforce, and supply chain challenges, and gain clarity on next steps in your digital transformation. Okay. I actually laughed when I read that, <clears throat> like out loud, audibly, when I was sitting here, because that, that's coming from Rockwell Automation. A um, couple of things jump out at me here. And I, I think it's awesome. John's going to be at the fair. I love uh, many of Rockwell's products and I definitely love lots of the people at Rockwell. Um, but do I think that Rockwell is positioned to talk about the changing face of manufacturing, how leaders are leveraging technology to tackle sustainability, workforce and supply chain challenges? And would I go to Rockwell to gain clarity on the next steps in my digital transformation journey? There isn't a snowball's chance in hell at all. Go ahead and hit your wagon to Rockwell. Okay, absolute statement here. Hitch, hitch your wagon to Rockwell. Go all in on Rockwell for your digital infrastructure. And you're done. You're a dead company. Okay. And I, and I've been doing this for years, been doing this for years, challenging someone from Rockwell to come here and defend the way that Rockwell has approached digital transformation, the way they defend mergers and acquisitions. I want them to, I want them to come and defend their connected enterprise approach. I want them to defend the white labeling approach. They do trying to buy solutions at various layers of the stack. Their, their, you know, um, unified approach, the unified stack trying to own the stack, some of the business decisions they make to like steer, um, to steer you towards a solution that's less optimal for you. I, I've been trying to get Rockwell to come on here and do this for years. They're never going to, by the way, because it's indefensible. Rockwell, there's no one, no one from Rockwell can publicly defend their choices. S certainly not against a host who knows the way Rockwell operates. There's no way Rockwell can publicly defend it. That doesn't mean Rockwell doesn't make good products. It doesn't mean that you're going to go wrong if you if you select a Control Logics PLC or even if you decide to go with Plant Packs and Innovation Suite for a, a specific solution you have in your organization. Say I'm building a new reactor or something, right? If I want to go with Plant Packs as the foundation for that automation infrastructure, okay, there there you you can't you're not going to go wrong there. But you're going to go wrong if you put Rockwell at the center of your digital infrastructure. I mean, that's a decision to destroy your company. Because what you've done is painted yourself into a corner. You have limited the potential solutions in the future to only the things Rockwell can provide you. Okay. And I mean, and we have a long list, 30 years of examples of things Rockwell can't provide very well. Okay. Um, but I, I just thought that was funny. I, I literally laughed out loud at, at this this post um, from them. Um, quick reminder, Mastermind Call is this Friday. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I got sick this past weekend. I got a stomach bug, actually a really nasty one. Um, and so we had to postpone MES Boot Camp Session 5. Actually, the, everyone voted to postpone it until this, this Saturday. So... Uh, I think like 60% of the votes, 70% said push it to Saturday. So that's what we decided to do. Um, you guys can vote. You can download the calendar invite on IoT.University or you can reach out to Josh um, through Discord and he'll send you the calendar invite for session five. Those of you who are in MES Bootcamp, you should have re received the uh, session agenda for five plus the master checklist for the MES Bootcamp, which we did send out. You'll also be receiving your instructions to do the get pulls for code templates, et cetera, later this week. <clears throat> I am feeling a lot better. Um, actually, I was feeling a lot better yesterday. Um, but I'll tell you, it was a, a rough two days. <laughs> um, and then uh, last announcement, uh, our podcast, um, IoT World selected uh, the 4.0 Solutions podcast here as one of the top 20 best IoT podcasts. Um, on the interwebs. So big shout out to IOT world. Thank you for that honor. Um, and then, um, Cheryl wanted us, wanted me to say this, 
um, IIoT is one component of digital transformation. We would be interested in asking how our listeners would characterize our podcast. Actually, this is a good question. So how would, for those of you who are watching, you know, in the comments below or in the chat, the live chat right now on the live stream, um, how would you characterize this podcast? Like, it, how would you describe to someone else in our industry what this podcast is all about and why you should listen to it? That actually would be really helpful. Um, Cheryl says, I like to think that the 4.0 Solutions podcast covers the bigger picture of digital transformation and all the challenges towards achieving it, both technical and organizational. Hence today's topic on why most digital transformation initiatives fail in their first iteration. That's good feedback uh, there, Cheryl. But for those of you that are watching, please, you know, how would you characterize this podcast? Um, yeah, something that's really important to note, uh, I get a lot of feedback here in, in, in all of our sessions. You'll get, uh, if you look at all the things that we do, if you got MES Bootcamp or Mentorship or Mastermind or the podcast or any of the uh, one-off training sessions we do, in nearly all of the training sessions we do, there are two elements to those training sessions. So whether that's a podcast or anything, one of them is going to be a discussion about organization, uh, leadership, values, philosophy. Okay. And then the other part is going to be a technical in industry specific um, topic. Okay. And I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from a small group of people. It's a it's a narrow group where you know people want us to just focus on the technical elements. You know, hey, I, I you know I, I'm not interested in the leadership discussion, or I'm not interested in the values discussion. Okay, I I just want to learn the technical aspects. Well, I appreciate that, I really do. But I, I do think that one of the things that really sets us apart from other content creators out there. Okay, and you you can go look. Go go look up other content creators in industry 4.0 and industrial automation. They 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 struggle to gain traction. I get this all the time. People reach out. You know, how do you guys get? How did you build your audience? How did you, um, you know, how do you get so many so much traction on LinkedIn? And how do you get so much traction on YouTube? Well, it's really quite simple. I mean, if I'm being honest with you, most people. It, this is why we do the leadership and the organizational discussion discussions. Most people are not being themselves when they are having conversations about what they do for work. Like when they're having a professional discussion, they are not being themselves. They're fake. I and mean, we see it all the time, right? You know, they come up, they try to come up with some methodology. They try to be a professional, right? And, and they try to put forward a, a vision or a language or whatever that um, that tricks people into listening to them. That's the best way to, to put it. It's just like in this industry when it comes to digital content. We, I, I ask myself three questions before I ever get on, with, before we ever shoot a video, okay? A little insight. Number one, what am I trying to say? Like, what are the actual words I'm going to say? Okay, so today... The words I'm going to say is, uh, I'm going to do some announcements. I'm going to give industry 4.0 updates around the Arduino Opta PLC, the Siemens Accelerator program, which I think is garbage, basically. Then I'm going to have a conversation about 80% of digital transformation fails on the first try. I'm going to talk about a Fanix CNC thread that we had on LinkedIn. And then I'm going to talk about why you must win the war of ideas. Notice we moved the leadership and organizational stuff to the end of the podcast today. That's what I'm going to say. Then I ask the question, what are you going to hear? So I know what I'm going to say, but sometimes often what we say is different than what other people hear. I mean, this happen, This happens all the time. Like, uh, you know, when I was married, I would say, you know, I would say A. My ex-wife would say, you said B. And I would say, no, I said A. She heard B. I said, hey, she heard B. This happens all the time, right? And you, I mean, it, so number two, I would say, what are you going to hear? Okay. Um, what's the audience going to hear for each of those things that I say? And then the last thing is, and this is the most important thing is, 
what will you guys, what will the audience say was the most valuable thing they heard in this video? What's the most valuable takeaway? Okay, now what we try to do is have many valuable takeaways based on segment. So I want there to be a valuable takeaway when I talk about 80% of digital transformation failing on the first try. I want there to be a valuable takeaway when I talk about the FANUC CNC piece. I want there to be a valuable takeaway on why you must win the war of ideas. I ask those three questions. Do you know what other content creators are doing when they go on their videos? They they're trying to sell you something. That's why they gain no traction. I, I watch other other people's YouTube videos. And I go, you know, if you look like look at Kudsai, right? Or you look at Tim Wilborn. Like if you, uh, Kudsai, he's the industry 4.0 TV guy, right? K Kudsai, he, all he, he, you can tell he asks the question, what am I going to say? What are they going to hear? And what are they going to think is the most valuable thing that I say? You can tell Tim Wilborn, who's the, he's the automation guy. I can't remember the name of his podcast. Forgive me, Tim. Love his stuff, by the way. He asks those three questions and it just so happens that they have huge followings, right? But if you go and you look at other people, and I don't want to call anyone out, but there's lots of them out there, they're trying to sell you something. They, their videos are trying to, it's like marketing bullshit. Like, and in digital media, digital media is all about organically sell, selling. It starts with connecting, starts with connecting on values and mission. Okay. And then if there's a solution that works out for you, I'm the type of person, you're the type of person I want to work with. And, and you know, how did you do that? What solution did you use there? The, the sale happens organically. It's not, there's a specific, you know, funnel that gets you to the sale. If you look, there's another, you know, there's a couple of other like initiatives, you know, um, um, <clears throat> You know, inductive automation just changed their training thing to say that if you want to get your your certificates, you need to go to in-person ignition training to get those certificates. You know, why is that? Is it because inductive automation th doesn't think that you can be properly trained remotely? No, it's because they want you to pay for the they want you to pay for the in-person learning. Now, if they want to give the in-person learning away for free and require that you go in person to get the certificate. I'm good with that. I'm, I'm totally good with that. Right. It, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be providing value. You have to be providing value to the people who are listening to you. Not just trying to sell them something. Um, all right. Off my soapbox there. <clears throat> That's how our podcast gets the traction it gets. It's not because I'm a, lovely personality and people just love talking to me. Most people think I'm a dick, you know, but they still listen. Um, all right, let's talk about the Arduino Optum. So I've been doing a ton of research. We're going to get a chance to review the Opta PLC um, before most other people. We're going to, we're, we're going to get a, uh, one of the PLCs um, to review on the, the channel here. Um, but you guys can go if you want to uh, Google Arduino Opta, O-P-T-A, PLC. But I just wanted to um, read the announcement here, what I what I personally think about this announcement, okay? Um, it's the secure, easy-to-use micro PLC with industrial IoT capabilities, supporting Arduino programming experience and optional PLC standard languages. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is that um, the Arduino PLC, the Opta is going to support IEC 61131 programming. So structured text, function block, ladder, in addition to the Arduino sketch programming language, which will, it, will, which will very soon support MicroPython. A couple of questions that I, ha I have centered around this, this new offering, uh, I have three questions. Number one, price point is still a little difficult to, to pin down, okay? Number two, scalability. And number three, um, can the two, it's dual processor. Are, do the processors 
operate operate 100% independently of one one another. That is, can I have logic dedicated to only being run on a single, on one processor and then running other sketches on the other processor so they're fully isolated so that I can manage resources individually, processor to um, process control versus processor to <clears throat> business logic. Um, I know that they're using RPCs for the two processors to talk back and forth to one another, but I, I do have some technical questions in terms of how it's constructed. My first opinion is if the price point comes in right, which I expect it to, okay, I expect this to be a very, very low priced PLC. It's, you know, it's a huge announcement and, you know, Rick, Rick, Rich, uh, or Rick Bellotta, you know, he wanted to point out, Hey, the most important thing to understand here is that you're getting IEC 61131 support in addition to the Arduino ecosystem. That's the fundamental piece here that you're, you're getting traditional PLC programming languages and control process control in a microcontroller that also supports the Arduino sketch programming language. Okay. So basically embedded control, you can marry embedded control with process control on the same unit and have, you know, standard industrial IO out to the field, which makes this a native IIoT PLC. Okay. Think of it as the lower priced version. So now what you'll have is easy automation <clears throat> in your, you know, $400 range, the easy logics PLC in your $400 range. Then you'll have your Opto 22, the Groove Epic, which is sort of your, you know, mid range uh, PLC with all your super horsepower on it. And then you've got, now you're going to have the Arduino right alongside the easy automation, easy, easy logics. Um, Josh, any questions I need to answer before I move on to this next one real quick? Uh, two questions on digital transformation journey, how engagement and commitment of leadership through building understanding of what DT is and what is not impacts the success and how does proof of value would you recommend? Um, yes, I'll answer that at the DT. That's a good question. Um, I want to talk, somebody asked me to comment on the Siemens accelerator. So Siemens accelerator, uh, which is accelerate your digital transformation journey. Siemens has this marketplace, <clears throat> which is it's Siemens accelerator is a new open digital business platform featuring a curated portfolio of IOT enabled hardware and software, a powerful ecosystem of partners and a marketplace. Okay. And, and there, there's a lot of confusion, I think for the consumer centered around this. Okay. They say the key customer benefits, number one, it's easy. So you have access to the latest technologies. It's easy to integrate, adopt and combine. Number two, it's flexible. You can pick and personalize the modular um, and interoperable offerings. And number three, it's open. You can join the ecosystem and benefit of the open offering. Okay. In a nutshell, I don't know what Siemens is using as the standard for what can be in the platform, what can be included in the marketplace. But when you rev when you go ahead and you view the marketplace and you kind of scroll through and you read the solutions and look at what's in there, these are not, you know, everything that's listed there, the hundreds of options, they are not interoperable with one another on common technology out of the box. Okay, that's the most important point to know. What they are is a list a list of solutions based on business case. That's what they are, that they are calling IoT enabled and are open on some in some capacity. But that doesn't mean they are interoperable with one another. Okay, so interoperable natively. It's a fundamental problem I have with it. I think it's misleading the way that they market it, but I think it's relatively exciting because it, indi it indicates a, a commitment on Siemens' part to take a step forward um, leading in digital transformation, which brings me to uh, why 80% of digital transformation initiatives fail on the first try. Okay. So there was this post on LinkedIn. Um, oh, Jan just, uh, Jan Madsen sent me, um, messaged me from Sweden um, at 12, 16. <laughs> um, I, I don't have permission to read it, but it looks, it looks like a good, uh, um, um, it looks like uh, a very good message. So it, lo it looks like he, um, 
Well, actually, let me go ahead and read it. I, I won't read the whole message. I'll just, I'll do the, it says, uh, they're going a different route compared to our business. He did. He acknowledges this, but we're probably advocating the same stuff and meeting similar obstacles. He's so he's openly admitting, Hey, I don't, you know, we're not advocating technology centric. We are advocating for putting a platform in the middle as opposed to going technology centric. So he is confirming, um, he tries to be proactive and positive in Europe. And some of your content has inspired us. And let me say this. I, I don't have any issue with what Jan is doing and what I'm saying or what Inuba is his company. If you want to check him out, Inuba, E-N-U-B-A. I'm not, I don't have a problem with what they're doing on face value. That is creating a business that uses ignition to solve problems. My problem is, and the issue that I take is that the language, the display the representation of the graphics using stuff that we clearly have developed that me that is designed to market a technology centric approach built on a unified namespace is being used to sell a platform centric approach based on ignition and it can confuse the market that's my point and it's part of the reason that digital transformation initiatives fail 80% of the time in their first iteration is that somebody could look at my graphic, they look at Jan's graphic, they look the same, and the guy says, and Jan says, hey, yeah, what he's really saying is put ignition here in the middle. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is technology-centric, minimum technical requirements. Mm -hmm. So digital strategy first. Why do I want to be a digital company? Why do I want to be a digital company? Number two, what is my architecture going to look like? That's the graphic he's putting up there. His architecture is put ignition in the middle. My architecture is put a unified namespace in the middle on common technology. Number three, minimum technical requirements. His minimum technical requirements would be, well, you need ignition and you need these modules and anything that you're going to add needs to be able to talk to one of the protocols that ignition talks. My minimum technical requirements are based on the technology. You got to support MQTT, Sparkplug B, whatever the, the standard is, whatever our pub sub technology is, whatever our broker is, okay, whatever broker technology we're using, those are our MTRs. That's the fundamental difference. Again, I don't want to diminish what Jan is doing, but you, the point still stands that the approach that's being taken, what Anuba, the approach Anuba is taking and not, and lots of other people, there's a lot of confusion in the market because the, if, if the messages look similar, but they're not the same, they're not the same. There is no limitation you're going to run into going technology centric. Let me say it again. If I go technology centric, I am not going to run into some barrier. I am not going to paint myself into a corner. But if I pick a platform and I say my the centerpiece of my organization is this platform, it's Azure, it's AWS, it's MindSphere, it's Factory Talk Innovation Suite, it's Ignition, it's Aviva System Platform, one one aware system platform. If I it's OSI Pi, <laughs> okay, you will run into an unlimited number of barriers. You will be painted into a corner and that corner, you will be kept in that corner um, by the limitations of the platform platform you selected. Now, someone will say, well, aren't I painted into corner by the limitations of the technology I selected? Well, sure. Uh, but that that's why you need to pick the right technology because you only fail for three reasons, wrong strategy, wrong technology, wrong partners. So yeah, make sure you pick the right technology. Pick OPC UA and you'll fail because you'll run into lots of limitations. Pick pub sub, edge driven, report by exception, lightweight, open architecture, some type of broker technology. Tell me what the limitation is. Someone's going to say, oh, it's the standards. It's uh, we don't have companion specs to tell us how to model data for CNC machines. Okay. Uh, um, okay, great. So let's go look at the technology that has all the companion specs. Why the fuck does no one use them? <laughs> Why aren't they implemented? Well, because guess what? People don't build their machines based on some companion spec. The OEM, the machine builder, doesn't use a companion spec to design information models inside their machines. They build them to solve the specific process problem that the customer hired them to solve. This is why your digital infrastructure needs to be a representation of the, the real plant floor. 
needs to be it needs to be a representation of the reality on the plant floor the real tags in my real plcs okay the 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 real register tables the real function blocks the real data types in in my intelligence on the plant floor not some model i created in the erp and i try to impose on in, in some abstracted way on my reality okay so we did this post um 80 of digital transformation initiatives fail on the first try why wrong strategy wrong technology wrong partners and one of the most important steps in strategy is understanding the journey starts with education not digitization i can't stress this enough Okay. And then I put in a chart that talks about what is digital transformation. And, you know, we've talked about this a million times. I'll do it again. It, digital transformation is about taking a dumb company and making them a smart company who plugs into a digital supply chain and employs the employee of the future. That's what digital transformation is. Why do you want to do that? Well, the answer is because you can't compete if you don't. It's not. And, and JP Monez had a great post a couple of weeks ago. I wish I I included it here, but JP made a comment in a post where he he said, I don't like the term digital transformation because it, it feels like a marketing term that's designed to create FOMO, the fear of missing out. I don't disagree with JP. In fact, I think that's how the term digital transformation is used frequently in our market. It's designed to just be a buzzword. Okay. This is why we stress what digital transformation is so frequently like what it actually is and how do you achieve it okay so if you look digital transformation the journey is is not a you di digital transformation is not a destination it's a strategy it's not a series of projects or use cases are you listening rockwell and emerson and deloitte and mckinsey it's not a list of business cases it's a fucking strategy stop ripping your customers off okay it's a strategy. It's a journey. It's a reason. It's a it's a strategy for manifesting why you want to be a digital company. And there's a huge difference between being a digitized company and a digital company. A digitized company, digitized company tries to eliminate paper. Okay? Tries to eliminate paper. A digital company is a company that can be viewed by software. A digital company is I, I have a digital representation of my business right now. I don't get on the phone to find current state of some important KPI. I have a digital representation. Human beings can see the digital representation. They can navigate it. They can look at the current state of the business digitally. That means software can consume those current states, things like current OEE calculations, uh, current, you know, actual versus plan, uh, produced versus planned produced, uh, first pass yield, second pass yield. You, a digital company is a company that can be, uh, it's like the scene in the matrix, right at the end of the movie, the matrix where Neo, um, pushes the bullets out of his body or he stops the bullets. And then there, it cuts to a shot where he's seeing the scene, but he's seeing it in code. He's seeing it in binary, right? He is, he was viewing the world digitally. He was viewing that scene digitally. A digital company can be done. It can be seen the exact same way. The company can be viewed digitally. There's a huge difference between digitization. Yes, JP. Josh, throw that back up again. Um, Darwin and evolution, it's just the digital version. Exactly. It, there, digitization is just taking paper things and turning them into software things, digital things. But just because I've built, I've, I've created digital things doesn't mean my business is digital. Because be, the, the, the business is the aggregation of all those things in a way that makes sense and is current. That's a digital company. But digital transformation happens in two huge steps, okay? It doesn't ever end, and JP's right about this. Digital transformation 
it, it is a strategy for running your business. It's not a destination. Okay. So step number one is you become a smart business. Okay. And that can take three to five years. So when, when these companies are doing these evaluations and they're giving you, you know, McKinsey's giving you a, or Deloitte or any of these companies are giving you this long list of business use cases. Okay. And they're trying to tell you that at the end, if you just go through this document from page one to page 90 and do all these things, spend this much capital, you're going to save this much money. Let me, let me state this. You never, ever, ever get the ROI that they tell you to, that they tell you you're going to get. You never, ever, ever, ever achieve the gains that they tell you you're going to change, you're going to achieve. And why don't you? Well, number one, you didn't start with a strategy. There's no reason why you want to be a digital company. Excuse me. You know, if, if you ask Elon why it's important that Tesla is a digital company, he'll tell you, well, we can't make cars that get better after you buy them if we're not digital. We can't improve just in, we can't reduce the cost of the Model 3 30% in eight months, the production cost 30% in eight months without reducing raw material costs, which they didn't reduce. All they did was they increased the efficiency of the actual production and the efficiency of the supply chain to reduce that cost by 30%. He would say, we can't do that without being digital. If I have to rely on manual business transactions, people moving things from this to here, so reading this digital document and then moving the data into this digital document manually. If we can, if we don't have that piece, we don't get rid of that waste, that point of waste, then I can't reduce the lead times of my windows for my cars from six weeks from St. Cobain down to one week. Uh, projects that are not greater than the sum of their parts. Agreed. That's actually a really good point, JP. The McKinsey and Deloitte, they're, they're just giving you a list of projects that don't equal more than the sum of their parts. I, 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 did, a, I did a sketch on a whiteboard one time. My son, my youngest son, Hayden, who's the smartest of all my kids. He's super brilliant, right? <clears throat> IQ over 150, off the charts kid. I mean, just super, super gifted. In years, I mean, this was a couple of years ago, three years ago, he asked me, um, dad, when you say, when you talk about iteration, iteratively on this common technology, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, creating a digital infrastructure that, that is where I can iteratively solve problems. That is solve problems in phases for every four to six weeks at a time, I'm solving a major business problem. Where when I take, when I, if I look at each four to six week window and I say, oh, the value of the, the ROI in this four to six week window was a hundred thousand dollars. And the value of this four to six week window was a hundred thousand. And the value of this four to six week window was a hundred thousand. That is the ROI. When I get to the apps act at the end, the business tells me that the actual ROI was greater than 300,000. Why? And so what I did was I, I, I showed him on a board how much capital, so human capital, um, intellectual capital, um, time and money goes into spinning up, um, a project. And if you look most, you know, integrators will tell you this. The most expensive project a customer, uh, an integrator will do the mo the 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 project that takes the most capital, time, resources, intellect, um, data gathering is always the first one. It's the one where you're learning everything. Okay, you're laying the foundation upon which you will build. You'll do all your other things. The reason you're the reason digital transformation fails. When you approach each use case as a standalone project is that you can't, you're not achieving the gains you're looking for it because number one, whoever is calculating the ROI is over projecting so that they'll, they'll get the sale. Okay. 
and they're not building, they're not stacking the gains on top of one another. And the reason they're not doing that is because they have no digital strategy. So there's no point of origin that they're working towards. Okay. Um, or common goal that they're working towards under a common strategy. They didn't pick a common technology. So interoperability, scalability is not baked in. Okay. The, you know, and they're using the wrong partners, the partners who are, their goal is to go deep and stay long. You know, there was a, there was one comment that I wanted to highlight. Okay. And it was this guy, Nader, Nadir, N-A-D-I-R, Koja, K-H-O-J-A. He said, you know, Walker, I agree with you on the digital transformation projects failure rate. Good. That number didn't come from me, <laughs> but it, it uh, thank you. He said, but I'm not able to relate to what the image is trying to convey. I feel step one is asking the right questions. Jumping straight to connecting might set you up for failure. Just my thoughts. All right. So what he's talking about is there's a chart. Josh, throw the chart back up um, in under step one. Yep. So the step one, becoming a start business, smart business, we have, we have connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize, find patterns, predict, report, and solve. Okay. Connect, collect, and store are in green. Analyze and visualize are in blue. And find patterns, predict, report, and solve are in purple. So he asks the question, if we're not asking the right questions, um, jumping straight to connecting might set us up for failure. No, we can't ask the right questions until we've connected to everything, we've collected everything, and we're storing everything. That first phase, the green phase, connect, collect, store, is all about acquiring the information we need to answer those questions we ask. Okay. Analyzing and visualizing is about building, is about building the solutions that'll help us answer those questions. And then finding patterns, predicting, reporting, and solving is about using software tools and digital tools to plug into that digital company to find patterns in that data we can't see with the naked eye causation, correlation. That's how you be successful. Step two, for those of you who are wondering, is plugging into a digital supply chain. Not just being connected to the link upstream and downstream, but to all the links, including the links I'm not working with right now. The potential links. And why do we want to do this? Well, many reasons, but there's a big reason, which is, you know, resource, you know, workforce management going forward. The employee of the future is a technologist who is enabled to solve their own problems. Okay. In the first major step of digital transformations, organizations are focused on unlocking potential on the plant floor through people. So while you're connecting, collecting, and storing, and analyzing and visualizing, the business case for while you're doing that, okay, is to just solve immediate problems on the plant floor. There's a long list of them. You can solve them. You do it under a common strategy and using common technology. Once we're fully connected, we're collecting everything and we're storing everything. Now we can start looking for patterns that even those smart people on the plant floor can't see with their naked eye. Co correlations. Here's a, re a really good example. A, a robot, uh, a pick and place robot that's on the end of a production line has some really important data on it. Okay. Um, that could tell us about how inefficient our process is or how we can improve the efficiency of our process. Okay. And that would have to be, um, you know, maybe what they're saying, maybe what the, if we were to analyze the data, the, the axis data on a, a robot as it's pivoting, picking something off the end of a conveyor and putting it on a pallet, we could use the robots along with some fairly simple machine learning algorithms to tell us whether or not our pallet is placed in the right place to give us the fastest cycle time. Now, in order to do that, you have to be connected to that data. You got to collect that data and you got to store it. Now, how do you know, how do you know that that's the pattern you're looking for? Right now, this use case driven approach to digital transformation means we only connect to the data we need, we only collect the data need we need, and we only store it in the way that we need to store it based on this specific use case. 
that's not a digital company. That's a use case driven, solution centric, digitized company. Okay, Josh, any comments I need to answer there before I pivot to this next? I currently see medium and large companies upgrading their core ERP environment, S4 for SAP shops. Their trusted partners are hemorrhaging money on doomed ideas. Invest instead in middle-class jobs. Agreed, Henry. So just randomly collect data? No, collect all data. Cherubin. Their rule number three, I think it's rule number three in digital transformation, is um, all data matters. Make no assumptions about how data will be consumed. You need to collect every event. Josh, can you go back to the original digital transformation question that you put up there? It was the original one 15 minutes ago, half hour ago. Two questions, uh, Michael. Uh, how engagement and commitment of leadership through building understanding of what DT is and what is not impacts the success of transformation? And how does proof of value, uh, how proof of value would you recommend? All right. I'm going to talk about leadership here in a second. Okay. But how bought in does a uh, the senior leadership need to be on digital transformation? Um, not very bought in. What they need to do is enable. They don't have to have a vision. They just have to have a strategy. You need to ask senior leadership, why do you, why do you want to be a digital company? What, what is your plan? 10 years from now, describe this company to me. The digital strategy comes from the senior leadership. With the questions we ask them, it's pretty simple. What is your digital strategy? What are your biggest problems right now? And who is the employee of your future? They'll go, we don't have a digital strategy. We'll say, great, let us help you write one. They're going to give us a long list of problems they have right now, which we will tell them, guess what? As you become a digital company, you're, you're going to, some of these problems you think are problems are not problems. You're going to throw them away and you're going to give us other problems you want to solve. That's part of the education piece. And the employee of the future, we ask them to describe the employee of the future to us. You know, and we'll ask them like, hey, do, do your employees have access to the Internet when they're at work? No. Why? What's the reason? I mean, you don't want them to have access to all of human knowledge. Well, we don't want them wasting time on Facebook. Well, great. Hire different people. Fire the people who are on Facebook, wasting their time. And keep the people who have access to all human knowledge. Well, I mean, it's pretty hard to hire people. OK, great. Turn over your human resources department. And hire a better human resources group who's more creative in recruiting staff. Proof of value. This is trickier. In the beginning, you're gonna have you're gonna have to make a business case, ROI, business case. Okay. Um, but the example that I use in terms of proof of value is I ask them the question: How did Steve Jobs? make the business case to his board of directors for the iPhone. What was the proof of value? How did he make the business case? Because the iPhone was groundbreaking innovation. You know, in the beginning, when they when the laser writer came out, the laser writer printer in 83 or whatever it was, how did Steve Job makes, Jobs make the case to his board of directors the how on how much what the value of the laser writer printer was going to be in the market especially since apple doesn't do any market segment studies the answer is we know there's value there i may not be able to quantify it but i know it's valuable this requires transformative and disruptive leadership it requires vision that lack of vision, that lack of transformative and disruptive leadership is the reason GM is doomed. Mary Barra is not a visionary leader. She is not a disruptive leader. She's not a transformative leader. Therefore, when I when we evaluate General Motors, we know General Motors is heading in the wrong direction. When we look at Jim Farley at Ford, Jim Farley is a marketing guy. He's not a transformative leader. He's not a visionary leader. He's not a disruptive leader. There, ergo, Ford will not. Ford will not uh, survive. 
foregone conclusion, absolute certainty. And and by trust me, right now people are like laughing at me, and uh, I'm right, <laughs> and it's a foregone conclusion. All right, I want to talk about transform, real transformative and disruptive leadership. Now, um, and it is this guy Jordan Husney. So this is, um, you know, winning the war of ideas. Okay, this guy Jordan Husney on LinkedIn the other day, a um, couple days ago, he said, uh, "Are you or your company considering going inactive on Twitter?" Curious to hear your thoughts. Today, Parabol, which is like a agile project management type software, communication software for teams, announced that we're pausing our participation there indefinitely. Here's why. And he posted like a end of the week blog thing he sends to his employees. He said, I'm planning on taking the energy I used to spend there here. And so I read the blog and it was basically um, Jordan doesn't like um, Jordan raised this, his complaints with Elon Musk. You know, I, I don't, I don't like Elon. I don't have any faith in Elon and I don't want to platform Elon. That's basically what he said. He said it in techno leadership bullshit speak. Okay. But it's horseshit. If he was in a, if he was at a cocktail party with me and we were having a conversation and he was giving me his highfalutin position, I would tell him he's fucking full of shit. That's exactly what I would say. I'd look him directly in the eye and go, you're full of shit. <laughs> you're, you're full of, I can't believe anyone buys this line from you. That's what I would say. He wouldn't push back on me. He would leave, right? There's no way he would, he wouldn't, he wouldn't step up to the challenge. He'd go find somebody who would believe his, his line of bullshit. Okay. So he asked, he said, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So I replied. And said, you know, in order for the best ideas to win, open discourse, including the worst ideas, are required to be heard. Words don't matter, ideas do. Postmodern thinking. So for those of you that don't know what postmodernism is, it is it's the enlightened belief that human beings say there's no truth. That truth is for the individual. There's no absolute truth. Okay. There's just each person creates their own truth. And, um, and there's no, and, and therefore no individual should be able to impose, you know, th their beliefs on someone else. Okay. Or use their, their standard of belief to judge anyone else. Okay. So postmodern thinking, relativism, relativism is what's good for you may not be good for me just because that you believe that that's true. doesn't mean I have to believe it's true. Uh, personal truth, nihilism have shifted the Overton window. In his piece, he talked about how Elon Musk is dangerous because he could shift the Overton window. And the Overton window in political science and sociological terms is what is the standard of what we think is acceptable in our society? So, and there's like six, six phases in the Overton window and you have extreme ideas on the far right, right? Um, he, he believes that Elon Musk will shift the Overton window, right? My argument is you're a fucking idiot. Any, any second or third year um, poli sci or sociologist knows the Overton window was shifted by postmodern thinking, relativism, personal truth, and nihilism. Nihilism is the idea that um, life has no meaning, that the meaning of life is what you make of that life, but that you're not here for any reason. It's just all by accident. That's nihilism. Okay. Um, and I wrote any second year poli sci or third year sociologist knows this. The war of ideas is won through open debate. Real leadership, real bravery is in the act of standing and fighting. Cowards take their ball and go home, retreating into safe spaces where echo chambers expand. Like homelessness, drug addiction, crime, poverty, and brutal violence, elites must have the courage to stand and face the realities head on rather than retreat to their gated communities, cocktail parties, I league reunions, and fundraisers. I'm more concerned that there are bad ideas out there wreaking havoc on the fabric of society, which was a term he used. And my solution is to stand and fight the rhetorical battles and win the war of ideas on Twitter, because it's the de facto town square. 
What you are proposing will only further to serve to bifurcate the discussion to the extremes safely in their respective echo chambers, and that serves no one. Stay and fight. That was my opinion. He said, I'm curious to hear your ideas. He replied, and he said, I largely agree with your point of view. The best ideas emerge through open debate. Open debate is messy and often unpleasant. Staying engaged takes effort and courage. But for Parabol, our decision to cease participation isn't centered as much on the quality of discourse, but on the business rationale. Twitter is becoming less and less a place where our audience is, so it's a no-brainer to leave. Our effort can achieve better return elsewhere. Suspending my personal activity is a different matter. For the topics important to me, I don't believe Twitter is a good platform for holding open discourse. I believe it's a capital, I believe it's capital motive prioritizes engagement even over a quality exchange of ideas. And of course, all platforms, including this one, he means LinkedIn, holds this explicit priority. Where I take specific exception to Twitter is governance. I simply don't trust Twitter's current leadership to represent my interests, which is quality exchanges over revenue, and have no better way to petition leadership other than to remove my engagement entirely. Now, let me say this. The reason I'm going through this exercise is I have conversations with executive leaders like this all the time. It's not always on whether or not our business should be on Twitter or not on Twitter. Oftentimes it has to do with what is their philosophy about people. When I ask them, when I ask executive leaders, who are the most, what's the most valuable commodity in your business or who are the smartest people in your organization? I'm asking them questions about what they believe. And this is an exercise on how I deal with those types of people. Okay. When they say bullshit, I call them on their bullshit. Most people, transformative leadership, okay, winning the war ideas requires bravery. Bravery. Most leaders are not transformative or disruptive. Digital transformation, you want digital transformation to succeed in your organization, you need transformative and disruptive leadership. So when he when he wrote that, when he wrote his response there, that's clearly bullshit. It's all horseshit. That's him create, he's trying, what it is, it's clear that he, he doesn't like Elon. Okay. He's got an issue with Elon and only Elon. His issue is he, you know, he doesn't want free speech on the platform. He doesn't want anyone to have a platform. He doesn't believe that for the, to win the war of ideas, even the worst ideas have to be communicated. He doesn't believe that. He believes only ideas he wants to hear should be communicated. So it's clear he's full of shit. So my response is, what is a business if it doesn't, on some level, focus on revenue to remain viable? Because he's saying, Elon is not looking out for my interests because I want quality exchanges of ideas over revenue. He was saying that's what his interest was. No, what he means is, in his opinion, a quality exchange of ideas is only the ideas I care about or the only, uh, only the ideas that I agree with. So I said, what is a business if it doesn't on some level focus on revenue to remain viable? Parabol focuses on revenue. My companies focus on revenue. Our investors focus on revenue. I agree with you. Your audience nor our audiences are effectively engaging with our companies on Twitter. And the reason why is because short form discussion doesn't suit technology very well. But you must admit that the predominant platform for open discussion of general ideas and opinion in real time remains Twitter. As principled capitalists, we make money to have a positive impact on the world, prioritizing the latter over the former. The best place for me and my companies to share our community mission in real time is Twitter. We fight rhetorical battles on our core values of transparency, authenticity, expertise, humility, and servant leadership. We connect with our audience and serve our business mission on LinkedIn and YouTube, more effective platforms for these messages. It really feels like you have a personal issue with Elon, actual free speech, or giving anyone you disagree with a platform to share their ideas. I just do not see how that serves your organization or our society at large, but I do see how it further serves to sow the seeds of division. Division. Blessings, Walker. And his reply, to his credit, was, I mean, you got me. 
I don't like Elon's leadership style and I don't like feeling trapped. So everything he said in his first post was horseshit. The whole, the whole exercise that he went through, through Slack with the 40 something messages about whether or not they should withdraw from Twitter and his message about, you don't need to listen to me just because I'm the CEO was all horseshit. And his initial response to my comment was horseshit. But it required me to go through the effort to call him on that. It required me to paint him into a corner and then see what he does. That's transformative and disruptive leadership. In practice is the way you see it. It's nothing personal against this guy. I'm sure he's probably a great guy. But if he's full of shit, he's full of shit. That's winning the war of ideas. Okay? So my response to him, and I want to be fair to him, so I want to make sure, was I said, Jordan, I appreciate the honest reply. Most leaders are going to double down once they've been painted into a corner, and I respect it. it I would still encourage you to stay on Twitter personally and professionally and fight the rhetorical battles in the war of ideas if you really want to, quote, serve people and manifest change, unquote. And that came directly from Parabol's mission statement. You can really have the positive impact on people and the world you seek by leveraging your considerable intellect and rhetorical gifts and community of 46,000 users to achieve this end on Twitter. At a minimum, consider it. Thank you for your good faith exchange and blessings to you and your team. Okay. So he got ratioed on this. Obviously, my exchanges were the most liked and got the most feedback from people who viewed it. If you go and you read his blog post thing, number 324, to tweet or not to tweet, there's a whole thing in there about basically, as, as companies, we need to not give Elon a platform. We can't support him. We can't advertise with him. And the only reason why has nothing to do with whether Twitter is a place where we can share ideas. It has everything to do with whether or not this guy believes certain ideas should be shared. Twitter was losing hemorrhaging money. Elon Musk went in and he laid off half the staff. Okay. He offered 90 days of severance to those employees. By, by law, he was only supposed to give them 60 days notice. Okay. He gave, he gave them, he offered 90 days of severance which means that he didn't fire people without notice. He's going to pay them for their time. He did everything by the book. What he's trying to do is restore free speech at Twitter. Okay. And he, and he's trying to, uh, what he's really trying to do is head off a serious, uh, political and social strife in our country. That's what he's really trying to do by giving everyone an equal say. His twi uh, uh, Elon Musk's argument is both sides of the argument should be equally unhappy. He gets that from our legal system, by the way. Judges do that and, and mediators. You know that you've done a good job as a divorce lawyer or a divorce judge if both, if both uh, spouses are equally pissed off. All right. You, that is an example of winning the war of ideas. Now, did I change his behavior? Probably not. He's not going to go back to Twitter. But there were a lot of people who read that. There was a conversation about ideas there. And it was an uncomfortable one. It requires transformative and disruptive leadership to win the war of ideas. You have to be willing. You have to be willing to fight the rhetorical battle. To win the war of ideas. In digital transformation, in digital transformation, you don't fight the theoretical battle, okay? You win the results war, results war by not fighting theoretical battles. But when it comes to ideas, you fight the rhetorical battles to win the war of ideas. All right, sorry for going over. Um, hopefully that was valuable. Josh, anything I need to touch on before we, we call it a day? Any Anything I need to answer? Um, 
Musk is fighting Davos and WF to stave off the Great Recess. That was Musk is about the Twitter acquisition at its core. Yeah. Hey, Paulo Solomons. Josh, make sure you take uh, Paul's comment out of here. That looks really good. All right. Uh, Amro Ubuzied, building your digital transformation strategy. Is it supposed to be easy? And how do you know your strategy is right for you? Can you give examples? Yes, we've shared. Um, yeah, we've shared example digital strategy statements. Um, I'll we'll put it in a we'll put it in as a community tile. So in the YouTube community, we'll post it as just like a, a slide. That's got an example in there. Hi Park, what's uh, Hi Walker? What is the best course of certification to study to work? in seaport to working on it. Ooh, that's a really good question there. Um, means you've recovered. Yes, I have recovered. Yes. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, comment below. Also, this format where we did the leadership organizational discussion at the end, is that better? Or would you rather me do that in the front end? My guess is you probably want me to do it at the end. That way you can drop off if you're only here for the technological argument. Uh, thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next.